so that we have this for those who weren't able to attend. But for everybody who doesn't know me, I'm Sherry Collier. I'm admin support for Sigma Iota Epsilon, a Sigma Zeta chapter here at the University of Dallas. I also serve as the interim advisor for a short period of time. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody to our first coffee chat of the semester. We hope that you guys uh, get to learn more about our faculty through these coffee chats and that you'll continue to support SIE by attending these events that we host specifically for you guys. Um, I'm going to share a little bit about Dr. Goldona for those of you who don't know, but Dr. Goldona is a professor of management and also serves as the Associate Dean of Academic Affairs here at the University of Dallas. Um, he is, he's received his doctorate in business administration from Temple University, where he concentrated in international business and strategic management. His areas of expertise include product and brand management, consumer behavior, international marketing, and business analytics. So we are looking forward to hearing a lot from Dr. Goldeno and his experience. Um, as he speaks, you are more than welcome to post your questions in the chat. So we'll allow Dr. Goldeno to share a little bit about him and his experience, and then we'll do questions and answers at the very end. So without further ado, take it away, Dr. Goldeno. Hey, thank you. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. Uh, frankly, I don't know where to get started. I mean, I could talk about so many different things, but what I thought I would do, I mean, you know, you probably uh, know some of these things, but I wanted this to be more interactive. So what I'm going to do is the following. I'm going to talk a little bit about my journey um, coming into America, how I became uh, where I am today. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about um, my favorite topic, culture. And then I will talk a little bit about um, how we could go about developing a global mindset, why that is important for all of us, and uh, how do you go about building your global mindset. And then I was going to open it up for questions. Does that sound uh, doable? Yep. All right. Sounds good. So, you know, uh, something about me uh, beyond uh, what uh, um, Sherry was talking about is, as you could see by my sign right here, I come from a country called India. So uh, my background um, is engineering. Now, and this leads to my topic of culture as well. So in India, even today, uh, but not as much, but in during my days, I'm an engineer by profession. So I did my engineering and then did nothing with it, right? Did nothing with engineering. And uh, it, therein lies the story. So I did my engineering, I'll come back to that. I did my MBA and then I came to America, did my second master's in international business. And then I didn't know what to do. So I... Uh, went on to do my PhD in international business and strategic management as was pointed out. And during that time, uh, my professor basically said, man, you got, I'm going to kick you out. You got to go out and get a job. You have to go get a job. So it was those days where internet was it in its infancy. I mean, some, some of you might relate to it. This was in 95. And uh, there was no internet, the way we know internet. There was some mosaic was the platform to interact, you know, the browser. And I used to say to myself, my gosh, somebody has too much time on their hand to put all these documentations online. So that's what I thought. And sure enough, my roommate was doing something and uh, he was using my dumb terminal in dorms. We used to have dumb terminals. So he was hacking his way away. I was asleep. And I'm a light sleeper. So I woke up and said, Arvind, what are you doing? Oh, I'm uploading my resume in ASCII format onto the discussion board. So what? I didn't even know. So he helped me convert. I posted this online. And um, so I was looking for jobs. And I got a call. And you thought about spams being common today. Spam was very common even in 95. I mean, I don't know how many emails I got in those days saying, hey, we'll help you better your resume, this, that, and all. I used to ignore those things, but there was one email with a toll-free number. I said, how wrong can you be 
when they're asking you to call a toll-free number. So I took a chance and I called a number. That number happened to be a company in Fort Worth, Texas. I had no clue where Fort Worth was. So this is the company that said, hey, we want to talk to you about you. I thought, okay, might be, there you go, my resume. But actually they were talking about a job. And I said, wow. So I hung up the phone and uh, before you know it, that called and left a message saying, go to the airport in Philadelphia, pick up your ticket and fly down to Fort Worth. So it came down and um, I interviewed for a job here in Fort Worth. And the CEO of the company made a phenomenal offer at that time for me, um, I could not refuse. So I, my only job other offer was in Perth, Australia um, to be a lecturer. You know, in, there they don't do professors, but they do lecturer. So I decided to take the job here. But my point in saying all this is, you know, when I said Indians, typically Indians end up doing engineering or doctorate, I mean, medical doctor. So this is kind of like a cultural thing. I mean, I don't know why, but you know, every other person seemed to be either an engineer or you just followed the herd, I guess. But that opens up my topic of conversation of cultural shock. You know, um, there are so many stories and that opens up my door for talking the next thing, which would be the global mindset. So first, let me talk about my own experiences in cultural shock that I experienced and uh, there, there is a reason why I'm saying all these things to you. So uh, I'm not gonna name any, anybody here because I don't wanna put somebody into some embarrassing situations, but uh, the good thing is that person is not here on this call, so that's a good thing. But you might know. So I'm in China, um, my, of the many shocks, I'm in China and uh, we are with our students and we have gone to uh, this organization called CCTV, which is the largest um, TV broadcasting in China. So we are with the deputy minister of uh, communications or TV or whatever. So there is a protocol to follow. So who sits on the right, who sits on the left of this person. And then they had behind a couple, two interpreters and uh, then all the students were sitting there and I'm sitting on, I forget, left or right or whatever. So we, you know, he gave a speech and that would go on in Chinese for a long time. Might be, you know, he would say for two minutes. And then the interpreter there at the back would say, hello, how are you? I said, what? What am I missing here? I mean, like uh, something is missing in translation, I guess. I don't know what it was, but you know, we, we went along for the show. And then when it came to question and answers, this is where it gets interesting. So one of them asked a very interesting question in my view, that is what happens when you record the shows using DVR and then you fast forward? You skip the ads. Ad generation was very big for them. So this gentleman said something and then um, went on for might be three, four minutes. And then one of the interpreters said, uh, kind of like saying, it's a stupid question. So everybody started laughing. And uh, then he got very offended, that man. So he went off out of the five minutes and then the other interpreter corrected this person. And then as we were about to walk out, he spoke perfect English. He was a consulate general in Chicago. And he spoke better English than I did. And I'm thinking, okay, what is the deal here? So the shock element of it was for me more about um, not understanding the protocol there when you go to certain or countries where the tradition is so rich, you tend to forget that there is a protocol that this person has to use interpretation. It shows the hierarchical organization that one lives in. So um, again, all these things, I mean, I'm gonna tell you one more. Um, my own experience in India. I'm an Indian, as I told you before, 
So I was working in 2007, 2008 time period. We were trying to do something in India, you know, city of Dallas. So the Department of uh, Education here put me in touch with someone in India. Um, his name was Leonard something. And we were supposed to meet at the hotel. So I go to this nice five-star hotel. I have my cell phone on, my Indian cell phone. And I'm waiting and waiting. And I'm thinking, oh, man, it's so unlike of this American to not show up, uh, not be there on time. So after about 30 minutes, I see someone there. He's looking at me. I'm looking at him. And then he calls my cell phone. I said, oh, is that you? I said, I, I was shocked. I mean, I was literally shocked. My jaw dropped. Because here I was expecting an American. But he is an Indian. I mean, a lot of Indians who have a Christian name, right? I completely blanked out, I guess. Uh, so my point in saying all these cultural things was, even though I did my doctorate in business, uh, international business, even though I've traveled to 30 plus countries in the world, we tend to forget that we all wear our lens. And we are always looking at things with our lens. And over a period of time, as you know, if you're wearing glasses, you'll forget that you're wearing glass because you tend to see everything through that. And that, my friends, becomes very problematic because this is the thing that I was exper uh, experiencing and explaining to you is when I went to these countries and when you interact, not developing this notion of global mindset is what lands us in deep trouble. So, and you don't have to be an international business student to do all this, right? You could be, um, just be aware the fact that you need to develop your mindset. Mindset, and you might say to yourself, okay, how do I go about developing my global mindset? Let me give you a um, couple of uh, pointers for you. The first thing is, again, we tend to commit those mistakes, even I commit the mistakes even sometimes, uh, recognizing our own cultural lens. Because we wear our lens and we look through our lens and when we go and interact with other countries, if it doesn't fall into my line of sight vision, we think there is something wrong with the other culture. Not with me, but with other culture. That is lesson number one. I mean, that is where we end up with a lot of trouble, a lot of problems when we interact. I mean, all of us, you, you might say to yourself, oh, professor, this is all great, Sri. This is wonderful. But guess what? I don't do any business with foreign countries. What then? Well, even if your intended strategy is to be domestic, your suppliers could be very global. Right, your customers could be very global. So it is always very important for all of us to develop this global mindset. And the other thing that I would say to you is uh, developing and knowing your own personality traits. Having that openness. Openness of accepting other cultures, interacting with other cultures. Having that flexibility to be, uh, you know, to engage with other cultures. The curiosity to interact has to be developed because sometimes what happens is we fall into our comfort zones and, you know, we always want to be in our comfort zone. Let me give one simple example of the comfort zone, how you, how you could break that. And here I was in New Delhi. Um, it's a very... Uh, non-fancy restaurant, but there is a huge line because the food is so good and the lines run for like an hour and a half to two hours to get in. So I had all the time in the world. I was alone. Next day, I was flying back to the US. So in New Delhi, I went to the restaurant, which was really close to my hotel. I'm in line and about an hour and a half into it, I was doing some reading of local papers and all. I get called. My name gets called. So in runs this lady. And she said, hey, do you mind if I sit with you? Hey, I don't care, right? She said, hey, look, the minimum is the table has to sit two people. I don't want to wait in line. Do you mind if I join you? I said, no problem. 
And as we sat down to have food, and she was opening up and she was telling me, and this goes back to openness, right? And going away from the comfort zone. She is a British, settled in Australia, a lawyer. And she had taken three months off and traveled all alone in India, all alone. I said, don't you feel out of place? And she has traveled to places that I've never been in train without reservations. I said, well, how do you do that? She said, look, very simple. Again, this is me wearing my lenses now, forgetting about the global mindset, right? So she, she had a lesson for me. When she said, look, if I had come with my friends, do you think I would have interacted with you? There is no way I would have been with my friends. For me to interact with people from other cultures, I have to break that comfort. I mean, she didn't say all that, but I got it. I immediately got it as soon as she said that. So that flexibility, curiosity to interact with others and breaking the comfort zone, very, very vital. And you know, know what is expected in the other countries. I mean, what is other countries? There are all tools, by the way. Thunderbird uh, Business School has a phenomenal free tool where you could put in, you can go in, I can send you the links. You can go in and put your traits where you come from. It'll ask you a series of questions and what country you're gonna go. And it'll map out and show you where your thinkings converge, where your thinkings diverge. So this is where you will have to spend more time thinking about, okay, where do I diverge? And how do I um, you know, ensure that the areas where I'm very divergent, I build some competencies to bring those things closer and closer. Again, breaking that comfort zone will get you there. And build inter intercultural relationships. I mean, it's very important to have those relationships. Uh, and in some relationships, um, you know, I mean, some cultures, relationships matter a lot. You can pick up the phone, get a lot of work done. Uh, again, understanding where we come from, where they come from. Very, very important. Uh, typically, we as Americans, uh, I mean, I include myself in that because I've been in this country longer than I've ever been in India, uh, right? I mean, though I was born, brought up there, I spent more years in America. And what we tend to do is we always try to get to business first. Uh, that's not the case in other countries. They want to break the ice. They want to get to know you. They want to do a lot of other things. I know you must have heard this a lot, but I'm telling you that is so vital. Might be we spend only five minutes in talking about the business. 45 minutes is spent in talking about you, I know them and getting to know them and all this stuff. And finally, you know, you need to develop uh, uh, the, the trait to be, adjust yourself. Like, you know, uh, I will leave you with this thought, you know, when in Rome, uh, be like a Roman. I mean, you heard this term uh, at age used all the time. It is so true. When you're there, you have to be like them. You have to understand where did they come from. And again, when you look at just the traits, when you see it, you're looking at the tip of the iceberg. There is so much hidden underneath, right? And for you to know that, that lady who joined me on the table in New Delhi, was trying to get below that iceberg. She wanted to know what the culture is all about. That's why we, she went local all by herself, breaking her comfort zone. So anyway, I can talk about these things for, for a long period of time. I know I spent about 25, 30 minutes on this, but I know you might have good, interesting questions and I want to get to that. Thank you, Dr. Valdona. If you guys have questions, you can put them in the chat. I'll get us started, Cherie. Just sure. not even not related to international business at all, but I don't know anyone who loves data as much as you do. <laughs> Where does that come from? You know, um, it's a very interesting question. Um, when I was growing up, I was math phobic. I mean, I would run away from math. I would run away from statistics. Um, I remember, and I say this to my on-ground class whenever I teach it, that um, 
what happened is, uh, we, we, I'll give one, one simple example. I mean, I'm sure some of you can relate to it because I think all of you can relate to it because when you do data analysis for decision making, which is a required course, uh, what you find is, for example, doing t-test, right? And I had no clue what that was all about. I just mugged it up and I knew what to do. And I just, you know, in my engineering mathematics too, we do triple integrals and all. All I knew was left-hand side, if I can show that is equal to right-hand side in my equation solving, I'm done with it. I had no clue what they were. And then I come to Marik, I come to Temple. And I have to thank my professors there. They forced me to do the statistics again. I said, oh my gosh, I think I'm gonna flunk out of this course. But it is there they showed the reason why you do what you do, how you do it, but more importantly, where you apply it, how you apply it. The moment you connected the dots and all of a sudden for me, it was a light bulb, it just lit up. And I said, oh my gosh. In fact, uh, I'm looking through my bookshelf right there. I don't know where it is. There is 100 statistical tests. There is a, a book by Gopal Kanji. And you'll not believe, I used to have that as my bedtime reading while doing my PhD. So I used to read this book about 100 different statistical tests. When you use, why you use it? I mean, that had me motivated, that had me thinking. And then in the company where I was working in Fort Worth, the CEO, because it's a family owned business, thought that, uh, I mean, hats off to him, self-made millionaire, he's no longer, uh, he's, you know, may rest in peace. Um, but he thought a PhD should be able to do everything. So he went and bought projects from Dan and Yogurt and all the stuff. And he said, Sri, you have a PhD, you figure this out, you do all those projects. And I had, I'm like, what? Uh, but that is when I was able to apply those statistical tests into these things. So I helped launch, for example, if you look at Dan and Yogurt, I don't know how many of their fruit on the bottom yogurt I have helped, personally, I've helped do a lot of taste testings to enable them to introduce new flavors, new products and all. That is, and that got me hooked. So I've done work with Walmart, I've done work with Kroger supermarkets, helping launch new items. So that got me into it. That's awesome, that's awesome. All right, we have a few questions that have come in. Um, we have Matthew Davis wants to know, can you talk about when you first came to America? How old were you? Did you first live in Philadelphia? Yes, go Eagles. Ah, yes, yes. I mean, like my introduction to football began in 91. Uh, that is when I came to America. I, first year I said, oh, what the heck is, why are they fighting like this? And the second year I couldn't get away from my TV watching uh, Randall Cunningham lose the balls. And then, oh, you know, I used to bite my, my fingers, uh, you know, come on, get it, get it. It took them so long. I was in Dallas when they won the Super Bowl, right, two years ago. So, I mean, I waited patiently, but I came in 91 uh, to America. So I've been here ever since, um, but I do go back to my homeland uh, on and off. As Rajat Gupta, I don't know if you, I mean, Rajat Gupta, nobody wants to talk, to talk about him. He was the guy who ran McKinsey. So Rajat Gupta, now of course he's in prison and all for insider trading. Uh, he got caught on something, but, uh, Rajat used to tell me that, um, uh, I mean, he said this in the open ones, that if you're born, brought up in a country and you have spent 20, 25 years in that country, your heart is always with that country. So I do go back to India pretty often, as often as I can. I don't know if I answered that question. It might be a rambled on. That he said yes, awesome. Um, Michael Sarles wants to know, do you, find, do you find the need for icebreakers in other cultures in written business communication like emails as well? Um, so to me, um, even today, great question, Michael. There are, I, again, if I have a relationship with them, I don't use emails as much. I call them because 
um, you know, certain, I mean, even in business, I mean, I call them um, because I think is something could be lost in an email uh, communication and sometimes you may not be very clear and articulate, but there are times where you have to use emails, of course. But um, even in my email, if I were to show you one, uh, which I don't want to, but um, this is a formal email and, you know, they say, Srinath Bhai, you know, Bhai is like brother. So this is how he addresses me. One of the, I mean, he's a very senior professor back in India. Uh, he's probably like my father, but he still calls me brother. So I respond back to him as my brother. So uh, kind of like, you know, just the salutation itself kind of like breaks ice. But my preference is always to call. I like to break the ice with a phone call. Might be later on you can follow up with emails. Good advice. Okay, Oye Tunde says, in a culture that is different from that of your home country, can it be considered offensive if you stick to it versus acting like that Romans when in Rome? Yeah, I mean, you know, look, look that's, a, that's a phenomenal question. I mean, you don't want to go overboard. I mean, you just don't want to act and, you know, use their slangs and all. What I mean by that is if I, if I understood their culture, uh, there is this tendency, including me, to use uh, what we call humor, um, like, you know, all the time uh, when we do presentations. In some cultures, we don't. And you have to be very cognizant of that. So I'm not saying we have to go completely rogue in that country uh, and lose who we are. But at the same time, if you were to understand the do's and don'ts, there is a great book, by the way, the do's and don'ts, I mean, the do's and taboos around the world. For those of you, I mean, it's a great question. Uh, what to do, what not to do. Uh, it's called do's and taboos around the world. It talks about all these things. I mean, certain cultures, uh, you might think it's very easy. I mean, like, you know, to do certain things, you're not supposed to. And you would say, oh, okay, that's that's great. Um, so you're saying work-related. Um, so in, in work-related, again, if you, l l let me say this like this. I did a consulting project with uh, one of the multinational companies here. Um, and they are, they were very big. This is when outsourcing started happening a big time. So they want, they brought me in as a cultural expert to help them understand what India is all about. Um, because they would spend all the time in uh, calls and then they would get a huge email here. I just want to clarify, you know, here is the 25 things. So where was that coming from? So in work related, I wanted them, American managers, to understand where these people come from. So that, that is the kind of understanding I'm talking from work-related. Uh, but when you go there, um, understanding certain things. For example, let's say you, you make a job offer. It happens even today in, in India. I'm talking again from my experience. When you make a job offer, uh, typically people, especially entry-level positions, their family is still very involved in making the call. It's not just the candidate alone. So understanding why you need to give them some time to dwell on it, to think through it, that's what I'm talking about. Knowing their culture. That's good, that's good. Um, April Rousey said, um, she enjoyed hearing more about cultural competency. competency. Reminds me of the commencement speech, ask the fish, half the water, and the fish replies, what water? We just aren't aware of our own biases. Yeah, good comment. I mean, you know, obviously, I mean, you know, we, uh, you know, I do a, a simple experiment in my class. And I show them um, one particular instance where uh, I show them half the class, a particular outline of a picture. And I ask them to turn around and I show the other half, the other picture. And in, in less than two minutes, I've conditioned half the class to see an image that I want them to see. And the other half to see the other image. When I superimpose both, most of them, those who saw, the first image is that's all they get to see. They, that's what they see, even though both are there. 
And then I tell them, look, you know, you're born and brought up in a culture like North Korea. And you're, you're born, brought up 20, 30, 40 years into it. You do not understand what other things are all about. Because that's what you think, like being in the well. That's what you think the whole world is all about, right? So, Matthew, you're asking a question about, um, what is, uh, or some other questions might be there ahead. I don't know. Yeah, he said, are there any specific countries that are most difficult for an American to do business in due to cultural dif differences? Most of them, right? <laughs> no, actually, you know, um, yes and no. But here is my yes. Yes is um, in most of the European countries, it's easy to conduct business um, very easily, though, though cultures might be a little bit different. Um, where it gets very dicey for me is very deep ingrained cultures and where the language is not English. That is where it becomes so much more harder to interact and conduct business. Um, take for example, uh, China. Uh, you, if you don't know the language, I mean, and you don't know the body languages and all, uh, what, uh, you know, drives and you, you get lost out in negotiations and all this stuff becomes very, very hard. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I hope I answered that, uh, but it's it's easy to do, at least where you're meeting something, their language is, is the same. And the country is very interconnected, intertwined with our country. It's easy to do, either in trade or there is a lot of travel going back and forth. It's much easier to do. But those countries that are very isolated, uh, very, very difficult to do. Um, he also said, can you talk about specific business meeting icebreakers you've used over the years in different, in different countries and whether they were successful or not? So, <laughs> I don't know if they have been successful or not, but I can tell you this, I make a fool of myself sometimes. Um, just as an icebreaker, I open it up and I kind of like, you know, I make some kind of a joke. Um, I open it up. Um, sometimes I read uh, in terms of connecting with them. Um, there are a couple of things that I do. I read the local events and I try to connect that in my meetings. I open it up. Hey, you know, I, I saw the other day that... Uh, um, a woman is going to be the prime minister of this country for the first time. And so it, it kind of like, you know, opens up and yeah, yeah. So this guy at least knows something. The other thing that I've also done is if the language is not uh, troublesome and if I can understand the language, I, when I go from the airport back to the uh, hotel, I pick up some tidbits from the drivers. I say, hey, what's, go what's ticking? What's going on right now? So they give me something. And I use that as my icebreaker in my meetings. I say, you know, I heard that there is this uh, massive uh, thing that happened here. They say, oh, wow, this guy has come one step further. They open it up, they talk about it. So you do loose talk. And that's to me is icebreaker. That's awesome. Um, Alejandro says, do you think that organizations should focus on enrolling their employees and members in courses or workshops of the international mindset? Yeah, I mean, in fact, uh, Thunderbird does a phenomenal amount of work. And there is one more um, company actually called Global Mindset. They do this kind of uh, training. Um, tens of thousands of employees do it on a yearly basis. So Global Mindset, GEC, um, that I also went and got trained on how to train this in Portland, Oregon, actually. Um, they do about 10 to 15,000 executives a year. Um, yeah, I mean, organizations need to, especially if their customer base, supply chain base is international. It's very, very important. In fact, uh, there are some schools. What they do is this is, I mean, I, I, I hope I can, uh, we, we could do this here in, in EOD as well. I don't see any reason why we couldn't. When somebody joins, like for example, Alejandro, when he joined uh, nine months ago, six months ago, the program, we administer GEC, the Global Mindset. And it shows us what elements 
just like the effective leader, if uh, those of you doing effective leader, there might be that uh, strength finders, right? You must have done strength finders. And the strength finder tells you what are your strengths, what are your weaknesses? Kind of the similar thing with global mindset. It tells you what you need to work on. And then courses have small elements embedded purposefully to address those kind of gaps. And then uh, one of the school like Wake Forest, what they do is they do pre and post when once you're about to graduate. So they want to show that they helped build that global mindset in the student body. So very, very important. Good question. First of all, then this is Nero. I have a question. Yep. So you've been traveled to many countries and over the multiple decades. So do you notice that um, the cultural barrier in young generation or younger generation is uh, gapping, gap is getting bigger or bridging a gap or it's becoming more global culture versus more traditional? I think there is a convergence. Yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't say it's divergence. It's definitely a convergence, um, but it's still there are significant barriers. But overall, at the very macro level, as we have become closer and closer. Now, the, I say uh, with caution, because you know what has happened in the past two, three years is every country has gone with their own way. They don't want to do global. They want to be local. They want to, hey, buy American, buy Indian, buy Chinese. I mean, you name it, right? Every country wants to do their own. So with that, the trade has been cut off. The trade being very interactive, very interconnected, a lot of interactions going on. So when that happened, there is a convergence. I'll give you one example. I think Niru, in, in, uh, in the global uh, strategy course that you're doing, uh, the book also gives great examples where, for example, thank God to multinational corporations like McDonald's, Pizza Hut, the tastes are becoming kind of like still a little bit localized, but at a very macro level, they're becoming convergent. Uh, dress culture kind of like you know, among the younger generation, becoming more convergent. I mean, still differences, but still converging in, in that sense. So I, I would say there is more tendency towards convergence and divergence. I think there's one question left in the chat. Do you, Will says, do you have any suggestions for familiarizing oneself with a foreign culture before doing business there? Uh, how to do it or uh, are there any, there was a yes. question more. Yeah. Said, uh, how, to, how to do it. So what I was talking about the, um, the Thunderbird instrument, right? I mean, that would be one way to do it, um, to understand what is going on, read about them. And talk to people from that uh, particular culture. Maybe you know someone down here uh, who is from that culture. Um, so you could interact with them, understand w what to do, what not to do. There are a lot of good books, um, but the books can only do so much. Uh, but at least it, it helps you think how different certain things might be. Uh, there are very phenomenal online tools. For example, um, Hofstede. Uh, Hofstede, who did a uh, national culture study. Um, if you look at Hofstede's dimensions, uh, he lets you on his website for free, compare the culture where you are from and the culture where you wanna go on five, six major dimensions of culture, talks about where the divergence is. So you could even use that to your advantage to learn about the country. And, you know, uh, the other thing that I would say to you, you don't have to go it alone when you go to other countries. For example, American um, embassy in those countries where you want to do business, it is in their vested interest of the American embassy to enable more trade from America to their country. So what they do is, uh, I'm not making this up, it's called matchmaking. They call it matchmaking. They match you up with the right supplier, right company, in that country. It is their job to do it. Um, and they do a lot of heavy lifting for you. So when you go and interact with them, when you wanna buy something, when you want to establish your supply chains and all, uh, make use of the American embassy. 
I think we forget about the American embassies in the different countries and using them as a resource. That's a good. Yeah, and you know, uh, that also rings me one more thing. Not that, I mean, most of you are already probably well settled in jobs and you don't need a job. But the American consulate um, always recruits people for uh, foreign services. So there is an exam you could take like, uh, uh, you know, after your undergrad and master's, of course you have to be an American citizen for this. Uh, but if you take that exam and you pass it, you become a foreign services. Within foreign services, there are four or five different elements. One of them is this thing that I'm talking about, uh, commerce, where you become um, the matchmaking kind of a person. You'll be deputed to some country, you build up your Rolodex, you establish a relationship with the local companies and you bring American companies together. That's you know, predominantly your job. But what I've seen is a lot of these youngsters go get this job, work there for eight to 10 years, build up the Rolodex, and then they start their own companies. So, or they get recruited by big companies because you now know uh, interaction with so many other companies, big companies in multiple countries. Fantastic. Any other questions? Feel free to, to speak up if you have them. June says, do you have any advice for international students who are looking for a job here? Oh boy. Um, it's always tough, right? I mean, um, but, but I think we have phenomenal here at UD. I don't know if I made use of Handshake. Uh, we have a great platform at UD which uses Handshake and Handshake helps you match with employers to, um, to candidates like you. And I don't know, what program are you in? Can you tell me what program are you in? Um, oh, yes, sir. I'm studying MS in accounting. Okay, wonderful. And Dr. Susan Rehm, who's also here, can help you connect with them. But here's what I would say to you. I don't know how many of you know that we have on our website mini masters. These are called mini masters. So if you go to udallas.edu, um, can I share something here? Can very quickly in two minutes? Yeah, let me yeah. give you let me give you a host. Okay. Yep, there you go. You should be able to share now. Okay. I'm gonna get here and I'm gonna share this. So uh, uh, this is a good thing that she asked this question and I'm gonna share my screen here. So as you could see in the screen, if you go down, uh, let's say you're in accounting, you click on accounting. As a part of accounting, you get three mini masters or digital badges. So let's say, for example, you know, you're taking this series of classes, intermediate financial accounting one, intermediate financial accounting two, and advanced accounting. If you click on that, this is the digital badge you're going to get. But here are some of the skill sets that you pick up as a part of your classes. So let's say, for example, you can click on any one of these and it will open up your job openings right there. And if you clicked on, let's say, credit analyst, you should be able to apply for this job uh, directly from here. So if you click on it, and then it'll tell you how to apply, you have a resume, boom, you can apply right through. And we have this for every single program at uh, the College of Business. So it's not just financial, I mean, MBA, accounting, business analytics, every one of them has their own digital badges. You could even use that as one way to apply. But I would suggest to you uh, very highly that you do connect with our career services. Um, but here's the thing. At the end of the day, let me give you this thought. Every course that you take, you should, I mean, I know it's a COVID world and you're doing it online, but even then you could do it, which is have a strategy in place. Every course that you take, you do at least three new relationships that you build, people that you don't know. What happens is very often, somebody asked me this question international, um, we tend to stick with our own comfort zone. That is the same people, always together, always the same project. Oh, I know, Susan, I'm gonna do project with Susan. You know what, I've done 10 projects with Susan. I, I gotta learn something else from someone else, right? 
strategic about this and rule number 101, networking 101, you deposit more than you withdraw. If you're not done any deposit, if, since you're in accounting, I'm just using that. If you're not any, done any deposits and all of a sudden in the 10th course, you say, hey, I want to withdraw $10,000. I mean, like you didn't even deposit anything, right? So just establishing the relationships in the classroom is not enough. Might be have some coffee. And when they introduce themselves, they're working in this company, that company, they say, hey, I want to network with Michael. I want to network with Will. I want to network with, uh, you know, uh, Matthew, something like that. And next class, I want to do something else. But nurture those relationships. That would be something that I would also suggest to you. Thank you, sir. Welcome. That's great, Sheree. And that, that leads us into SIE and our organization and what we strive to do is to bring uh, the professionals from our school together to network and interact and, you know, come to these events and say, hey, you see Matthew, you know, on, in your online class, you can say, hey, I saw you at the SIE event, you know, let's get some coffee or, you know, do a virtual lunch or something like that, another way to get to know people. So use these opportunities to help you as you go along. And there was one question that came in from Jonah that says, is Handshake tailored for graduate level jobs? I found most of the jobs to be entry level. Can you speak um, to that? You know, I, 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 I'm not a user of Handshake, but I'm t uh, given to believe it's not because I know through that um, Handshake, uh, some of our graduate students also got uh, placed. The other thing that I would say to you is the following. Um, today, companies get, uh, there is one job opening, there are probably 2,000 applicants, right? So how do you stand away uh, on top of it? The more network you have done and go, use LinkedIn and see if in your LinkedIn, who among your network knows someone at that company? That would be a great way for you to, you know, go up the chain in terms of the number of applicants and at least your applicant application gets uh, some light of the day to be at least on the manager's table. Uh, but handshake, you know, I tend to disagree. Uh, could be, uh, might be off late, there is only uh, this thing is coming. But the other thing, if you're an international student, you should also be using something called interstride. So we have a package for international students called interstride. And if you're not very familiar with it, please use Interstride uh, through career services. They'll help you get on the Interstride. Interstride is specifically geared to international students. Uh, what I mean by that is uh, you could even search by only those companies that hire and sponsor H1s. Thank you, Sheree. Okay. And I'm very proud of that because I helped bring that in to UDN as well. So, uh, but, but I mean, that's the whole idea is, again, I am an international myself and I want to do something for international students as well. That's fantastic. That's why we love you, Dr. Valdona. <laughs> You're the best. Um, and then you mentioned... Um, just taking it back to LinkedIn and the digital badges. When, once you get those digital badges, which I issue, by the way, um, you can add them to your LinkedIn profile so companies can see you. I've been, I know I've been searched on there many times due to my digital badges, badges being on there. Unfortunately, I like working in higher ed, but, <laughs> uh, but, they will, but companies will look for you with those badges. They're official, they're legit. Companies want to use those. Yeah, and and uh, the other thing that I would also say is, uh, I think starting this month, uh, all digital badges will also, you can share them on ZipRecruiter, I'm told. I don't know how popular ZipRecruiter is, but uh, I, I know they, are, they advertise a lot, but um, you can not only share it on LinkedIn, but through ZipRecruiter as well. Any other questions? No, I was just going to ask Alejandro, did he have my pisco ready for mango pisco sour? <laughs> but but, but, uh, but then again, he's going to say virtual. There it is, you know. So <laughs> I was just kidding, Alejandro. I don't know if he's still there, but I'm here. But pisco's on the cellar. 
<laughs> Next time when I come to Peru. Of course. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, thank you, Dr. Baldona, for being hey, here. It was today. great. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, I really enjoyed uh, sharing what I know. And uh, even otherwise, connect with me on LinkedIn, just as Matthew said. Um, you know, if there is anything that I could do to help you in your career, uh, whatever prospect, not just me, every single faculty in the Gupta College of Business, for sure, at, and UD in general we are vested in your success. So if there is anything that we could do, do reach out. Do not hesitate to reach out to us.